Welcome back to Homesteading with the Zimmermans, where we work hard and play hard on our little corner of land in Iowa. My husband and I were born and raised Old Order Mennonite, or Horse and Buggy Mennonite, as some refer to them as. And although we are no longer part of that culture or community, we are intentional about passing on the old-fashioned skills of our childhood to the next generation. Good morning, everybody. Ruth Ann Zimmerman here for Homesteading with the Zimmermans. And we have had an extremely busy week, an extremely exciting week. Um, so as many of you know, I have written a book. And this week, um, my publisher sent an editor and a photographer. And we spent two days um, taking pictures of the farm. Um, the family, the garden, the the food for the recipes that are in my book. And it was so much fun. Um, we used up so much creative energy. Um, so that was Wednesday and Thursday. Today is Friday. Normally I have my weekly YouTube video all edited um, before Friday. And then Friday I just do um, the final run through and I upload it. Um, but today's Friday and I'm going to use all the, the last bits of my creative energy to get this week's video put together for you. Um, I've been getting up early and trying to get myself ready for when the kids go back to school. But number two, the reason I'm getting up early is because we are waiting on one of our cows to have a calf. Um, so I've been getting up and walking down there at sunrise to check on her um, and so far we're still waiting so this week's video is going to be all about doing sweet corn now growing up um, we had big sweet corn days and you know the family would gather under the shade tree and husk the corn and it as a child it seemed like a long endless day of hard work um, but now looking back those are some of my core memories with my siblings and my parents. And so no matter how much opposition I get from the children, Sweet Corn Day as a parent is more than just getting corn in the freezer. I mean, we appreciate the corn in the freezer, but more than that, it's a chance to build relationship through shared experience where the Children all come together and we work together and they don't know it now, but that's what's happening. They are building relationship through those shared experiences. And so I have a, even though I still had like 15 bags of sweet corn in the freezer, I knew that when I planted the corn, I just can't quite let go of that tradition of sweet corn day. It's just such a fun day for me as a parent, and it's a fun day. It creates memories. So here's me telling you the next year, I only need to plant sweet corn for fresh eating. We don't need to have a sweet corn day next year. We need to work through all the corn that's in our freezer. Um, but next year when I plant my garden and I'm planting that corn, I'm going to fondly remember sweet corn days of my childhood and sweet corn days with my older children. And I'm probably going to keep planting that sweet corn and dreaming of another fun sweet corn day. And then I'll be like, wait, I have so much corn in the freezer. <laughs> but you know, the, the good thing about having pigs on the farm is that if I find corn in my freezer that's, you know, a couple years old and I don't want to feed it to the family anymore. The pigs will turn it into bacon for us and it won't be lost effort and lost resources. So sweet corn day starts very, very early in the morning as soon as the sun comes up.
Good morning, everyone. It is somewhere between 6 and 7 a.m. I am in the garden. The sun is just coming up over the corn and it is sweet corn harvest day. Um, I'm down here early. It is going to be, we're gonna have a bumper crop of sweet corn. I took all of this off of this one row and normally I take it all off and then we go do chores. Then when we're done with chores, um, we all as a family start husking it. Elvin does not have to work today and he did say he was gonna come help me take corn off. <laughs> um, I haven't seen a sign of him yet. Maybe he's making me my coffee. I'm just gonna show you, don't mind my finger. I cut it on a sharp piece of corn husk. Anyway, I'm gonna just show you how beautiful this year's corn is. So beautiful. And the variety that I plant is um, serendipity. That's the variety that I plant. It's a bicolor corn. I always want to harvest your corn in the morning um, because the dew of the night converts into sugar. So your sugar content of your corn is gonna be highest in the morning. Um, and then as we preserve it, hey, there you are. <laughs> I look, I got all of this from this first outside row. Wow. Anyway, I know, but I don't want to drive the skid loader up by the patio. Oh. Um, so I brought two. Anyway, you want to harvest it first thing in the morning when the sugar content is highest. And even if you're buying sweet corn, um, you want to ask them, was this harvested just this morning? Um, because that's when your sugar content is going to be the highest. And I'll be talking as we preserve, I'll be explaining each step and the why's behind it, the why we do it this way, um, things like that. But Elvin and I have got a lot of corn to take off. This one's got green beans all over it already. No, string, uh, pole beans.
So now that all the corn is taken off, um, we still need to do morning chores. So I've gotten all the kids up and we're going to check morning chores off of our list before we start husking. While we were doing morning chores, Elvin made breakfast for all of us, and then right after breakfast, we start husking. Uh huh. There's a lot of sugar in it. Okay, chores are all done and it is time for us to start husking corn. The family is busy husking. I'm gonna get some water started to cook the corn. So the number one reason you want to preserve your corn um, on the same day that it was harvested with as little amount of time passing as possible is because when we harvest a crop, we are interrupting its natural process. So the natural process is for the corn to become fully ripe. And then when it's fully ripe, it will drop from the stalk down into the soil. And when it is released from the plant and drops into the soil, the enzyme, a natural enzyme within the cob goes to work and starts breaking down that cob. And then what happens is as that cob breaks down, um, the kernels fall off of the cob and there's this rich compost um, that is the composted cob right on the soil and that gives a perfect environment for the corn to start growing, for those little kernels to sprout and start growing. So when we harvest the corn at peak ripeness, right? Um, not when it's mature and ready for seed, but we harvest it when we know the sugar content is the highest, and that's on these young cobs, as you see in this video. But the minute we take it off of the plant, that enzyme that I previously explained gets to work and starts converting the sugar in the kernels into starch because that is its composting process. So to have the best tasting corn coming out of the freezer, you want as little time to elapse between harvest and freezing as possible. So that's why we harvest right away in the morning when we know the sugar content is highest. And that is by why we have a goal of having all of this corn in the freezer um, by lunchtime or shortly after is because we know that we have captured all of the texture and taste integrity that we want. And when we get this sweet corn out of the freezer this winter, it'll take us right back there to this summer day because it's gonna taste so much like fresh sweet corn right off of the cob. What you got? Oh yeah, Woo. that's a big one. Okay, lay it aside. So now we wanna blanch the corn because when we put the corn into boiling water, we stop that enzyme from working. So we stop the corn from breaking down. That's part of preserving it is stopping that enzyme. So I bring a large pot of water to boil. And then while it's boiling, I stuff as many cobs of corn into the boiling water as I can possibly fit in. And then 
we're going to cover the pot and leave our burner on high and as soon as it comes back to a rolling boil where every part of your pot has boiling water um, that's when we're going to remove them. I don't set a timer or anything. I just wait until they're back to a rolling boil and then I remove all the cobs and then the next part is just as important as bringing them to a boil. So as soon as you remove them from the boiling water, you wanna plunge them into cold water um, because putting them into cold water stops that boiling process because you don't really need to cook your corn. You really just need to stop the enzyme process. Um, so boiling paralyzes the enzyme or arrests the composting process and then putting them into cold water and cooling them as fast as possible will stop the boiling process because you really don't want to cook the corn you just want to stop the composting process so when we dump this hot corn into our cold water our cold water of course starts warming up so that's why i use two tubs because then we're constantly switching um, corn from warm water into colder water to get it cooled down um, properly and faster and we drain out the warm water and refill that end with the cold water and then as the family keeps on husking i stay busy um, putting more corn into boiling water and removing corn from boiling water and keeping it cooled down So once the corn is cooled, um, the pressure to hurry up is not as intense anymore because we know that cold corn um, is not composting or you know fermenting or breaking down. Um, so as the boys start cleaning up, um, the girls are gonna start taking the corn off of the cob and I am going to link these tools that we use for taking the corn off of the cob. So you'll find that link in the description of the video. So the other tool that we use and is always the beginner's tool is this corn creaming board. And this one was a wedding gift from one of my aunts or maybe from my grandma. Um, but I'm gonna see if I can find one to link for you. And this will cream the corn, which means it gets more of the creamy part of the corn off instead of just the kernels. Um, but we don't keep this corn separate. We mix it in with everything else that we cut off and just use it all together like that.
So the girls and the little boys did such a great job in cutting off the corn that I barely got a chance to show off my fancy knife skills to all of you. Um, but using a sharp knife just like this is the way that my mom and grandma taught me to cut off corn. And we would all sit around and cut corn and knives were just uh, cruising over that corn. Um, so this is still my personal favorite way to remove corn from the cob. So as soon as I'm done running all the corn through boiling water and cooling it, um, I will start bagging the corn while the girls keep cutting the corn. And then because we've been snacking on corn all morning, lunch is going to be late and we're gonna have more corn with a side of hamburgers and chocolate milk. So after all 50 quarts of corn were in the freezer, it was time for us to start on cleanup. So we divide up the jobs and some of us clean up the kitchen while some of us clean up the outside. And the pigs, of course, are happy because they get a treat of all the hus and cobs. Okay, I'm going to answer a couple questions that I get about Corn Harvest Day. And here, again, I'm not saying that my way is the only way. I'm just saying this is the way we like our corn. Um, and this is the way my mom and grandma taught me to do corn. So the number one question is, why do we not just freeze the whole cob and then serve it as corn on the cob? And the number one reason for that is the amount of freezer space that a whole cob takes up versus um, when you cut it off. I don't have that much freezer space to spare. And the number two reason is to us, corn on the cob is like, it's a, it's, it's really, really good because we're, my family is used to eating corn on the cob that has been harvested like two hours ago. And the sugar content is amazing. The texture is amazing. And so we, when corn has been picked that way, my family can each eat between four and six cobs of corn. And my one son-in-law even can eat more than that. Um, so we love sweet corn when it's fresh out of the field. We can always tell, every one of my family, down to the youngest, can tell when corn has been picked the day before because it's not the same. It's not the same when it has been picked the day before. Um, so this brings me back to when you're buying corn, make sure that you know what day the farmer has corn for you and then you block off that day to do your corn because the longer you let it set, the more you're gonna lose 
flavor and texture because it's going to start getting gummy and starchy and you won't be happy with your end product. Anyway, all of that to say it wouldn't be worth for me to freeze the cob because my family knows what fresh sweet corn tastes like and they would not like it from the freezer on the cob as well as they do straight from the field. Um, so that w that's my, my first question that I field a lot of. The second question that I get is people will say, well, when my grandma and my mom did corn, they would cut it off of the cob before they boiled it. And then they would take all of that corn that they cut off and put it in big pans and cook it that way, right? Okay, so the reason I don't do that is number one, cutting corn off of cutting corn that has not been blanched or, you know, um, boiled for a little bit is very, very messy. And when you cut into that, it, the <laughs> corn just spritzes everywhere and you'll have corn mess going everywhere. So that's the number one reason I don't cut it off and then cook it. The number two reason is I do not want to mess with all of that corn that I've cooked off is now thick and sugary and put to put that over heat and bring that whole thing to a boil. Um, you would want to use no more than this deep corn in the bottom of each pot. And you want to stir it constantly because the sugar content is enough that it would scorch to the bottom, right? And yet you want to bring it to a boil to stop that enzyme process. Um, so you'd have to really heat it and keep it boiling um, and keep it stirred so you can heat it thoroughly. And then the next hurdle for that is how to cool it all back down. How do you cool all of that corn and get it cold enough so that you can put it in the freezer. Plus, like I said earlier, you wanna stop that boiling process as quickly as possible because you don't need it boiled. You just need to heat it enough to stop the enzyme process. And for me, boiling it on the cob is much faster and easier than boiling it in a big kettle. So those are some common questions that I field every time I share a sweet corn day. So now for the fermenting part of this video. Remember, we're using the hashtag meant to ferment and I'm challenging myself and you guys can join me if you want to ferment something every week. So in last week's video, I made beet kvass and I also fermented some cucumbers. So I let the cucumbers ferment for about I think it was about five days and I don't want them to get all mushy. So I wanted them to still be a little crunchy and taste fermented. So what they taste like to me using last week's video, and I can link it in the description for you is they taste like hamburger dill pickles. Um, it's exactly what they taste like. They taste very much, I'm after the small ones, those are my favorite. They taste very much like a hamburger dill pickle, um, maybe slightly less sweet. Um, I've had people tell me in the comments that to get accustomed mm -hmm. to eating fermented vegetables, like say these pickles or fermented cucumbers, that you're used to having a little bit sweet um, they've told me that after they ferment them, just before they put them in the refrigerator, they will add some honey or maple syrup just to sweeten things up a little bit. So uh, when I've got about half of these gone, I may try that um, to see if the family likes them better than they like them now. Um, but I don't want to put honey or maple syrup into this entire jar because I'm afraid that it'll ruin them and that I won't like them so much anymore. And I'm sorry for the angles that I have to use in my kitchen. Um, the photographer that was here this week agreed with me that my kitchen is not set up for any type of filming or photos. And even though I have a lot of natural light, the angles, I just have no room for good angles 
But anyway, in today's video, what I'm fermenting for this week for my Ment to Ferment challenge is garlic. Um, we had a, a beautiful garlic harvest and I am going to make some honey fermented garlic. Um, so now the garlic that we can grow here in our area is the hardneck garlic, which is more the big chunks. They're just bigger all around. Um, so I'm taking some of the bigger cloves of garlic and cutting them. Um, you can also mash them a little bit with the, well that didn't work, with the handle of your knife or you can just cut, chop them up a little bit. Basically, you wanna break open that outside shell. Um, so the children peeled all this garlic for me and I'm gonna fill a jar. You can use a pint jar or even half a pint jar if you want, um, but the key is to fill your jar halfway with garlic. So when you've got your jar half filled with um, garlic, chunks of garlic, then you're gonna take raw honey, it's gotta be raw, and you're gonna fill your jar with raw honey. You're just gonna take a knife and let the honey run all the way down. And then you're gonna top the jar off with some more honey until you bring the honey level all the way up to about one to two inches of headspace. So then you're gonna need to turn your lid on tight and let it set upside down for a while. And this will just help coat all the garlic. So let it set upside down until it all runs to the bottom and then you're gonna turn it right side up. And you're gonna do that upside down thing at least once a day for the first week. And if you forget, you haven't really ruined anything. It's just to keep all the garlic coated in honey. And then um, in between those times, you're just going to set the lid on loosely um, so that their oxygen can flow. So how will we use this fermented garlic? Well. The plan is to use it as a immune build, building supplement. So when we feel a cold or something coming on, we'll eat a fermented garlic clove, a honey fermented garlic clove um, as a supplement. And you can take the honey um, to soothe your respiratory or cough um, that you get with respiratory issues. And you can also use it as a condiment. My family really loves the honey garlic chicken. Um, so this is probably something that we will throw in the blender and use on chicken. Um, and after about a month, it's considered fermented. Um, but I've heard people say they let it sit on their counter for a year and it's preserved and it doesn't go bad. So I will be showing you my fermented um, honey garlic along the way throughout the next couple months and let you know what it looks like. So what have you been fermenting? Please show up in the comments and let me know what your experience has been. Share your tips and tricks and we'll encourage, you, encourage each other that way. And if you're wondering why I'm wearing a sweater, well, it feels like fall here today. Um, the temperature has yet to reach 70 degrees and it is after lunchtime. Um, so yes, I went for my cashmere sweater and 
I'm just going to say I'm not ready for fall. I still have a lot of green tomatoes out there that need to see 85 to 90 degrees so that they can ripen before frost hits. Um, I'm very anxious to stock my pantry or our cold room with more tomato products. So hopefully soon you'll see videos of me doing tomato products. Um, but I keep telling myself it's okay. I always get very anxious about my tomatoes this time of year because it feels like frost is looming and I need about 150 quarts of tomato products to get us through the winter. So thank you everybody for watching. We will be back next week and we hope to see you back here next week as well.